All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, lovely to, to see you all. Thank you for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be here at this uh, conference and in your uh, beautiful uh, country during uh, spring, which, yes, is rather reminiscent of, of winter at the moment. I, in fact, I actually got a little bit sunburned yesterday. I went to, went to the Sky Lounge and uh, I got sunburned, which is remarkable. So uh, it can't be all bad. So I'm, I'm having a lovely time. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you so much for coming out early this morning to listen to this presentation. I really uh, appreciate your, your attendance and I hope what I have to say will be of some interest and value to you all. Before I get to my presentation, I just want to uh, give you a, a little bit of background as to why or what led me to come up with what I'm about to present. And what I'm about to present is really a result of a struggle or a problem that I had been grappling with uh, for many years. And this is the problem. Why is it the case that the biomedical model in mental health has become so dominant, both in healthcare and in society, over the last four decades, while at the same time as it's presided over very poor or questionable clinical outcomes? How has this come to be? Well, this is the question I set out to answer in this presentation. And the answer I give, I believe, is useful in helping make sense of the predicament in the UK and in the US. But I also think that some of the ideas I'm going to share with you today can go some way in helping you to make sense of how things have evolved in Iceland. So to start my presentation, I first want to refer to something that the eminent uh, British professor of clinical psychology once said with respect to the poor outcomes in our mental health arena. He said the following, if as a child I contracted leukemia, my chances of survival were around 20%. But if a child today contracts leukemia, their chances of survival are around 80%. That constitutes an improvement in outcomes of around 300% over the last four decades. And this remarkable feat isn't only reserved for paediatric oncology, since impressive rates of improvement can also be found in almost every other area of medicine. I say in almost every other area because Sadly, there is one exception, the area of psychiatry and mental health. In this area, the area in which I, and I suspect many of you, work, not only have clinical outcomes broadly flatlined over that same time period, but according to some measures, they have actually got worse. For example, the efficacy of psychiatric drugs has not, in fact, improved since the 1980s, despite billions spent in research, marketing, and promotion of these psychotropics. Also, we've seen mental health disability rates in the UK, but in other major Western economies, literally treble in the last few decades. And the prevalence of mental health problems rise inordinately, despite, in many societies, levels of general well-being in the community not necessarily getting worse. And when we look at the most severe forms of mental distress, we also notice that the gap in life expectancy between people suffering from those problems and the rest of us has actually widened by double in the last few decades, from 10 to 20 years. These dire statistics exist despite, for example, in the UK, are having invested over a quarter of a trillion pounds in mental health services and research since the 1980s. And despite around a quarter of adults in the UK receiving some kind of mental health intervention in any given year. And yet, outcomes are still not improving. So to understand 
what has gone so sorely wrong, I want to take a seemingly unconventional route. I want to take us back to August 1844, when two young intellectuals met in this cafe, Cafe Région in Paris, to discuss a terrible epidemic that was then sweeping across Europe, one rooted in the rising and rapacious industrialism of the age. For them, industrialization was making people sick because it was so exploitative. The captains of industry were paying people unlivable wages under difficult working conditions to inflate their profit margins. And these two men became convinced that these exploitative arrangements had become so normalized in the population that people had lost touch with their essential human rights and needs, leaving them in a state of political apathy where they no longer believed they could fight for a better world. And in this demoralized state, all that remained for them were soothing illusions, sedatives to compensate them for the painful oppression they endured. The two men in this Parisian cafe were, of course, <coughs> Frederick Engels and Karl Marx. And by this, the first time um, of their meeting, Marx had already set about trying to identify one of the most powerful sedatives of the age, what he believed to be organized religion. Marx argued that religion, by teaching people that their suffering in this life would be rewarded in the next life, was instructing people, and usually the most disadvantaged people, to accept and endure, rather than to fight and reform, the harmful social realities oppressing them. As religion sedated the distress that would otherwise galvanize people, to political action, he famously referred to it as the opium of the people, an ideological sedative powerful enough to disable the impulse for social reform. Now, while most students of sociology will be familiar with this uh, Marxian critique, we cannot forget how radical it was at the time. In fact, what Marx's early writings on religion helped establish was an entirely new and enduring style of analysis in the social sciences. One that was embraced, by the way, by both thinkers on the left and the right of politics. One that focused on how the main institutions of society, whether we're looking at healthcare, education, law, the media, etc., how all of these institutions always adapt themselves to what the economic paradigm of the day demands of them, coming in effect to serve the economy's will. And this was particularly true for those institutions like religion that directly explained and managed human suffering. After all, once a sufficient number of people came to suffer under a given set of economic arrangements, those arrangements wouldn't survive for long. People would either challenge them through the democratic process, through organized opposition, or when such processes failed, through civil unrest. Consequently, those social institutions responsible for managing emotional distress were critically important to the aims of any economy. They had the power to diffuse politically dangerous emotions by sedating sufferers to the real social drivers of their distress and by distracting them from what should be the true targets of their reform. Now, the reason I've taken this detour into the salons of 18th century Paris is because I believe that the ideas hatched back then can help us go some way in explaining the failure of our mental health sector to improve its outcomes since the 1980s, during the period 
of what has been called late capitalism or neoliberalism. And just to give you a, a brief definition of neoliberalism, neoliberalism is the word used to describe the style of capitalism that has dominated in most Western economies since the 1980s, introduced by Margaret Thatcher in the UK and, of course, Ronald Reagan in the US. So in other words, what I want to explore is how since the 1980s, our mental health sector, by struggling to survive under this new set of neoliberal economic arrangements, has inadvertently adapted itself to serve the needs of our economy, but at the expense of generating the good clinical outcomes we all want and deserve. So how has this adaptation worked? What are the mechanisms that have enabled it to become the handmaiden of neoliberalism? Well, the mechanisms I explore um, and I've written about are many. I'm only going to cover a few uh, today because I don't have so much time. But these are the things that happen within the sector that align the sector to the wider political economy. And they often happen behind the scenes. And what I'm going to do is identify them to you. I'm going to start with perhaps the most obvious. I suspect most of you have heard of this mechanism. This is the mechanism of medicalization, the process by which our mental health sector has increasingly pathologized our emotional, behavioral, mental, and relational lives. So since the 1980s, under the control of the psychiatric profession, the mental health sector has progressively renamed more and more of our natural and normal, albeit painful, human responses to the problems of living as indicating psychiatric conditions that oftentimes require some kind of psychiatric intervention. And this medicalization of everyday life, life has occurred through manuals such as uh, the DSM, the book that includes all of the mental disorders believed to exist, a book that has expanded rapidly since the 1970s, where it had about 106 disorders, whereas today it's around more like 360. In addition to expanding the number of disorders, the book has also significantly lowered the bar for what constitutes having one of these disorders, in effect making it far easier for any of us to be classed as mentally ill. By expanding the definition of mental illness to encompass ever more domains of human experience, the mental health sector has not only changed how we respond to distress in healthcare settings, but how we respond to distress in the wider world, whether we're looking at behavioral difficulties at school, underperformance at work, grief at a significant loss, the effects of unemployment, discrimination, trauma, abuse, poverty, social exclusion, social injustice, etc., and so forth. These are now some of the manifold painful human experience that are now liable to psychiatric framing and psychiatric intervention. Now, the over-medicalization of everyday life has, of course, been underwritten and promoted by the very industry set to benefit most from it, the pharmaceutical industry, which has encouraged the medicalization of everyday life at every turn. After all, once widespread suffering has been medicalized and pathologized, it all now needs to be treated. And the treatments that have been generally preferred since the 1980s have been psychiatric medications. And this brings me to the next mechanism by which our mental health sector has gained dominance in society despite its ongoing poor outcomes, and this mechanism we'll refer to as commodification, the process by which our sector has transfigured suffering into a vibrant market opportunity. It is now almost common knowledge that the uh, creators of DSM um, um, had financial ties to the pharmaceutical uh, industry. This is an interesting 
uh, study by Lisa uh, Cro Co uh, Cosgrove, um, which looks at the conflicts of interest on the committees that wrote DSM uh, 4, and they were widespread. One particular thing to note here is that on the committees that were working on the diagnoses for which drugs are the first line of treatment, all of those members had financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry. Okay? Also, if we are, uh, when we look at DSM-5, the most recent edition, out of the 29 people who wrote, uh, comprised the task force, 21 had financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry, including the chair and the vice chair. So we know there are conflicted relationships between pharma and the DSM, and this has served pharma well. As the uh, uh, chairperson of DSM-3, probably the most famous figure in the history of the DSM, commented, the pharmaceuticals were delighted with the DSM, presumably because it created a vast and lucrative market for their products. But let me, now, let me now give you a couple of examples of how the pharmaceutical industry has promoted the DSM and thereby the medicalization of everyday life. The first comes from a trip I took uh, to New York City in uh, 2013. It was six months after the DSM-5 had been published in the US. And I was one evening looking for data on the sales of the DSM because I was set to deliver a lecture the following day at, at uh, Columbia University on the making of DSM. And as I was looking, I stumbled upon something that completely took me by surprise, that shocked me, and it was the following, that the highest selling book at that time on Amazon.com, in effect, the highest selling book in the United States of America was the DSM-5. Number one. And by the way, it had been in the top five for six months since its relief. At release, let me give you a sense of scale here. Harry Potter, you know Harry Potter? Yeah. He was at number six. Fifty Shades of Grey, do you know that? Goes quieter. <laughs> that was at number nine, okay. This book is not cheap, by the way. A paperback copy on Amazon cost $88. So who on earth was buying this book? A couple of days later, I'm interviewing um, a professor of medical anthropology at NYU. And at the end of the interview, I put this question to her because she works in mental health in the New York State primary care area. And I said, I found this out. What's going on? And she said, James, you don't know. I said, no, what don't I know? And she said, well, let me tell you. The bottom line is that the pharmaceutical industry has been buying DSM in bulk and then distributing copies for free to clinicians up and down the country, she said. That's why the figures are soaring. Why would they do that? As almost any kind of suffering is caught by the DSM, disseminating it is just good business. It drives up diagnosis rates and with this, prescriptions. Let me give you another example. This is closer to home in the UK, and this concerns a, um, a depression questionnaire called the PHQ-9. Have any of you heard of PHQ-9? Do you have it here in Iceland? Yes. Yeah, you do? Okay. All right, good. I, I wasn't used to hear about this then. All right. <laughs> PHQ-9. This is one of the most powerful documents, it has been, less so today, but it has been one of the most powerful documents in UK mental health sector. Why? Well, because this is the document primary care physicians in the UK use to assess whether or not a person is depressed, and if so, how severely. So you hand it to the patient, the patient fills it in on the basis of the score, you, 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 you determine whether or not they're depressed. Now, one of the major criticisms of this document is that it sets the bar very low for what constitutes having a form of depression for which a drug can be prescribed, okay? Which is why around 85% of British patients who fill this in get prescribed 
drugs as a consequence. Now, what the tens of millions of British people almost certainly didn't know when filling this in is that this document was created by, its distribution throughout the NHS was paid for by, and its copyright was owned by Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, which incidentally makes two of the most prescribed anti-anxiety and antidepressant drugs in the UK. So here you have a company setting the bar very low for what constitutes getting a drug, while at the same time as making, manufacturing, and profiting from those very drugs. And this has been going on in the NHS for many years. So the spread of medicalization has therefore opened the door to the unrestrained commodification of our distress, creating a vast market for psychiatric drugs, now worth over uh, 25 billion pounds a year globally. The main benefactors of this market have been the drug companies, their shareholders, and on occasion some political allies, and those psychiatrists and organizations who've been in wide receipt of industry money in the form of consultancy fees, sponsorship, donations, research funding, and other contributions and honoraria, all being forms of remuneration that research has shown again and again bias recipients in favor of industry products. And so, while the commodification of human distress has proved very profitable to sections of the psychiatric, uh, corporate, and political communities successfully monetizing the management of distress, the consumers themselves, from whom all this profit is derived, may have cause for complaint. Due to the poor efficacy of most psychiatric drugs when compared to placebo, the lack of declared conflicts of interest that are widespread within our mental health sector and certainly have been in the past, the methodological corruption within the evidence base behind these medications, the wholesale underplaying of harms, and that's another story that can be told at another time, and the strong association between long-term psychiatric drug use, which, by the way, is proliferating in society, and worsening clinical outcomes. And, of course, um, Robert Whittaker, who you'll hear uh, from later today, has done some phenomenal work uh, in this uh, area over recent years. Okay, so we've looked at medicalization and commodification as mechanisms that have helped our sector to survive and expand despite its poor outcomes. Let, we, let me move to another uh, mechanism, and I want to call this uh, productivization. And this is the process by which our mental health sector has conceptualized suffering as disadvantageous to the economic order, and so as something to be challenged on economic grounds. So here's a picture. I just want to put this here to cheer you all up. Um, you know, okay, okay I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, Margaret Thatcher becomes Prime Minister of the UK in 1979, Ronald Reagan, uh, president of the US in 1980, uh, and this is the point at which psychiatry, at first it publishes DSM, DSM-3, but also for the first time, psychiatry starts to, in the US, reclassify under performance at work, or what it calls occupational dysfunction, as a key symptom of mental uh, disorder. And what are the, some of the symptoms? Uh, we have things like if you experience fractious working relationships, if you lack workplace motivation, or if you are deemed to be working at a level uh, below expected, then you can score high on its uh, mental illness assessment scale, which is non-ironically called the GAF. You might not get that gag. That, that, that's, a, that's a British gag, yeah. I, I'll strike that one out next time. That, that, <laughs> that didn't work. Okay. Um, 
But this scale, you can score high on it if you experience these things at work, which of course makes you more liable for a psychiatric diagnosis and psychiatric uh, treatment. So psychiatry's new project of medicalizing worker underperformance aligned perfectly, of course, with a central pillar of Reaganite and Thatcherite at social policy, which was to increase what is called labor productivity. What's labor productivity? It's the output of our labor per hour of our work, right? They wanted to increase this. This was suffering significantly at the time. So neoliberal governments from the 80s onwards uh, aspired to improve worker productivity with new social policies. And as you can see, it kind of worked. As to the psychological fallout of this, that's another matter altogether, but people did become more productive through change in social policy. But also at the same time, psychiatrists and drug companies were promising to improve worker productivity by way of altering the very dynamics of self, tackling the low moods and the low motivation deemed to threaten the economic order. So the pathologization of any um, uh, economically unproductive emotional state not only chimed with this new neoliberal agenda, but it also saw drug companies marketing their pills as economic correctives. And here you have Eli Lilly creating reports for uh, government making the argument that depression makes people unproductive, which costs money. Drugs correct depression, therefore we should be prescribing more of these drugs because they're going to make more and more people productive, which is good for the coffers, right? So these are reports explicitly making that uh, argument. And these arguments really set in train a legacy that still drives our mental health policy today. The mental health interventions that get implemented by government are those that profess to solve first and foremost economic problems. And in, in my uh, book, I write about um, uh, this uh, program in the UK. It's called the Increased Access to Psychological Therapies Program. So this is the program in the NHS that provides psychotherapy for free to the British populace. Uh, when I say psychotherapy, I have to, I have to kind of hedge that because what it is is really between two and six sessions of a kind of watered down CBT, if you're lucky, but more and more what you're getting are web-based interventions. Okay, so you get sent to a website where it tells you how to manage your mental health. There may be a chat bot that kind of, you know, uh, deals with your problems for you. Um, the idea that people actually get long-term psychotherapy uh, is, 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 is not the case. So we rolled this out in 2006 and it's still going, but the key arguments that convinced government to implement this were... If we implement this, we're going to reduce the mental health disability bill. We're going to reduce um, unemployment benefits. And also, we're going to get people back to work. A key measure of success is returning people to productivity, right? That's how it measures success, which may be one of the main reasons why it's woefully failed. The outcomes for IAPT are very, very poor. You're almost better off not going, right, for this service. And yet it still gets funding, et cetera, and so forth. And I would argue it gets funding because, again, it's not really about helping people recover in a meaningful sense. It's about serving the economy, while at the same time as appearing to look as though you care, okay? I could say more about that, but I'll leave that for now. So, productivization. Our system aspires to make people more productive, and that's good for the economy. Another key mechanism that is attractive from the neoliberal standpoint. Let me now move to a further mechanism, uh, something called individualism, uh, which again aligns our mental health sector with neoliberal policy. This is the idea that the individual is the sovereign architect of their destiny. 
that the person you are has little to do with the circumstances in which you were raised, just as the good life is mostly achieved through heroic, heroic feats of individual effort, rather than through collective togetherness, support, and activity. From this standpoint, success is seen as an outcome of having exceptional individual qualities, rather than exceptional social privileges and advantages, while failure is seen as rooted in personal deficits rather than in lack of opportunity, equality, and social support. So this pivot from the 1980s towards locating failure in self rather than in system not only helps justify cutting many welfare, labor, and social protections, but also nurtured deep political quietism in the population when it came to how we understand emotional suffering, failure, etc. It's a product of something going wrong within us rather than within our wider society. So no longer is suffering seen as a, the organism's legitimate protest against difficult social and environmental conditions that are holding us back, but now from the 1980s onwards, it's seen as an index of some kind of internal dysfunction that needs to be treated, a cognitive or a chemical dysfunction. And this shift towards favoring self-reform through drug interventions over at social reform through policy interventions was symbolized when the US uh, Congress in the 1980s slashed funding for community and social mental health services and benefits, while at the same time as it doubled the funding for biological psychiatric treatments. We also saw this in the UK uh, where uh, the project of taking people out of hospitals and caring for them in the community becomes tantamount to managing patients' medications in the community and not doing much else. All of these changes, productivization, individualism, commodification, medicalization, also dovetails with another key mechanism that has enabled our mental health sector to thrive despite its poor outcomes, and this is depoliticization. This is the process by which our mental health sector has conceptualized suffering in ways that protect the current economy from criticism. And to give you um, an example of this, uh, I want to refer you to the work of someone called Dr. China Mills, who is an associate professor of global mental health at, at the University of London. And this is an example she gave me as to how depoliticization works. And I'm going to share it with you because I think it's a particularly good one. Um, and this example con uh, concerns the terrible epidemic of farmer suicides that blighted central India between 2000 and 2010. So what was going on? Well, at this time, large multinational agricultural companies were trying to create new markets for their products in India. And they were doing this by replacing traditional crops that farmers had always used with genetically modified plants that didn't produce any seeds. And this was crucial because it meant farmers couldn't save the seeds to plant for next year's crop, which they'd always done. Instead, they now had to buy expensive new plants from the, from the multinationals every year, and this was throwing many of these doctors into crushing debt and poverty. As a result, and as the research indicated, thousands of farmers were killing themselves under the resulting stress, mostly by drinking toxic pesticides. But in the face of these terrible suicides, rather than challenge the multinationals, the Indian state sent in teams of psychiatrists and psychologists to tackle what was now being framed as a mental illness epidemic. Uh, 
It also launched a campaign with the World Health Organization to make antidepressants more freely available to the farmers, a campaign which was partly funded by, it turns out, these very agricultural companies. It was as if the primary solution to the suicide epidemic was psychiatric rather than political. Nowhere was suicide seen as a desperate response to a situation made unbearable by the multinationals. This misuse of the mental illness narrative I think illustrates very well the essence of how depoliticization works. And I put it here. It effectively turns socially caused problems into internal dysfunctions, making the self the site of reform and thereby exonerating harmful social, corporate, or political arrangements, and so by implication, helping nullify in people the forces that push for social change. Going back to Marx, remember, suffering was a key factor in generating social change. Mm -hmm. Gets rid of that through treating it. But such depoliticization of distress isn't clearly only happening in India. It's happening in most Western economies in various sophisticated ways. And I want to give you an example from the UK by drawing your attention to this. So in May 2015, on the London Underground, I suspect most of you have been on the London Underground, you've seen these kind of ads above the seats, right? Suddenly, all of these posters appear. Nobody knows who's put them there. They're completely anonymous. But these are all over the tube, and this is the kind of stuff they're saying. They're saying the following. And this is on the, the early commute to work, right? People are reading these. It's as if someone were out there making up pointless jobs for the sake of keeping us all working. Huge swathes of people spend their days performing tasks they secretly believe don't really need to be performed. How can one even begin to speak of dignity in work when one secretly feels one job, one's job should not exist? Now, rather than people just smiling wryly at another odd thing that happens on the London Tube, happens all the time, that's not what happens. Actually, uh, what happens is that this sets off a social media storm. Thousands of people start posting and discussing these posters online. Um, the press picks up on them and starts writing about them. And I heard about them because at this point I was working at the University of Exeter on a research program on work-life balance. And part of my uh, job was to do a kind of systematic review of the evidence around work dissatisfaction. And we were countering some pretty worrying stats. I'm not going to go through everything with you. I'm just going to summarize what we broadly found um, as a result of our review. Firstly, that around two thirds of UK employees identify as being dissatisfied with and or emotionally disengaged from, which means they don't really care about the work they do. These figures are somewhat, I checked with Iceland, they're similar to your rates as well. Um, around 40% um, feel their jobs make no meaningful contribution to uh, society at all. During the pandemic, we heard a lot about how it adversely affected our mental health, right? You no doubt heard about that in Iceland, and this is true. You know, lots of people were uh, feeling worse off as a consequence. What we hear less about is the other side of the story. Um, we know from a big study in Lancet that in the UK, about a third of the population actually reported feeling a boost in well-being and their mental health as a consequence of the first two lockdowns. And when they were asked, what are the reasons for this, the majority of people answered at being free from having to go into the office and do work I just don't really enjoy. Okay. All this illustrates that the problem of worker dissatisfaction is a massive one now for Western economies, and it's been getting worse and worse since the 1980s, to the extent it's beginning to cost a lot of money. In the UK, employers are losing between 30 and 50 billion pounds a year, it's estimated, as a consequence of this problem. So employers now want to do something about it. And what are they doing? Well, they're inviting into the room these guys. These are the workplace consultancies. These are the organizations that are going into the workplace and uh, 
claiming to turn this problem around. So how are they uh, doing it? And by the way, you've now got some of these consultancies working in Iceland. There are about 80 such consultancies working in England alone. How do they do it? Well, essentially, it's quite simple. What they do is that they train individual members of the workforce to be the go-to people in the office if someone is feeling down. They also train these individuals to spot the signs that may indicate one of their co-workers is feeling distressed so that they can recommend that that individual goes and seeks some kind of support through an employee assistant program or through their uh, GP. And I actually trained as one of these go-to people. It's a two-day training. Um, I learned a lot of things. I learned for the first time in 20 years what mental illness really is. I hadn't, hadn't known up until that point, but thanks to this course, I, 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 I finally was illuminated. They also taught me how to spot mental illness of others around me. I didn't know about that before. I've, wor I've worked in the NHS for um, you know, 10 years, but now finally after this two-day course, I know what, what mental illness looks like. I know what to look for in my co-workees. In fact, they gave me a list of things to look out for. Right? This list is published by ACAS, one of the biggest consultancies in the UK. These are the things that you need to look out for in your, in your co-workers because they indicate the existence of a potential mental health problem. An increase in unexplained absences or sick leave, poor performance or timekeeping, poor decision-making, lack of energy, uncommunicative or moody behaviour. ACAS provides no rationale why these experiences should be read as symptoms of mental illness. This is all the more surprising since none of these map onto any official diagnostic criteria. But what is more surprising is that all of these experiences could be better interpreted in non-medical ways as classic signs of worker dissatisfaction or disengagement. In other words, this isn't mental illness. This is what people experience when they don't like their jobs. So what we have here on a national level now in the UK is a reframing of worker dissatisfaction as a mental health issue for which the individual is largely responsible. And what this means is that organisations are exonerated from responsibility, okay? Because the problem is within you and it needs to be fixed within you. But more than that, it exonerates the wider economy from responsibility, okay? What are the structural economic factors in wider society that are making working life far less bearable for more and more people? Well, we know what they are. Sociological research has uncovered them. Here's a list of what they may be. Flatlining or falling wages relative to inflation. Rising wage inequality. Increased short-termism in the employment market. The erosion of unionized working protections. Longer working hours. Growing pressure for dual working households. Lower job security. Higher job precarity. Rapid expansion of the service sector. So these mental health consultancies don't factor in any of this. They go in, they reframe distress that is often sociologically rooted as index of something within you for which you now need to go and get treatment. And what's that treatment? A couple of sessions of back-to-work therapy, if you're lucky, or, of course, a psychiatric prescription. But such depoliticization of distress um, of modern conditions um, doesn't only permeate our workplaces. It colors every social institution where mental health tropes are now embedded. Just consider the uh, mental illness narrative and how it's being uh, used to distract from some of the real reasons for growing despondency and depression in our undergraduate student population in the UK, which is far, far higher than it was 20 years ago. Largely because, and this is what, again, the more sociologically reform, uh, um, informed research shows, largely because present-day undergraduates 
sense they are entering a far less benevolent world, where there are now large students' debts to repay, decreased prospects of ever owning a home, where the job market is more competitive, where wages are flatlining, and where careers for life are disappearing. Despite the obvious economic and social reasons for higher rates of mental ill health in present day undergraduates, the narrative around worsening mental health in student populations is still mostly depoliticized. The cry is for more mental health services, not for serious reflection on and reform of the harmful social policies that are dampening students' hopes and dreams. This latter domain feels too big, so instead we focus on mental health away days, relaxation hours, or better access to GPs. I've got a couple of minutes, I could go on, but I won't. I've got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to, I'm going to bring my presentation now uh, to a conclusion. So, the alignment between our mental health sector and late capitalism or neoliberalism was never purposefully plotted behind the scenes. The actual truth, in my view, is far less enticing. Our mental health sector has, like most major social institutions, simply come to embrace those ideas and practices that have best secured its own perpetuation. It has become what it is and has continued to thrive and expand despite its poor outcomes by following the path of least resistance, by moving with rather than by defying the dominant neoliberal tide. As Michel Foucault once put it, political power embraces the ideas and practices that best serve its own ideological aims and interests. Ideas and practices that come to shape reality on the ground. So the interventions that get funded and implemented are the ones that ignite the ideological passions of the powerful. The great fault in our services then lies just as much with those who have funded bad ideas as with those who initially contrived them and then marketed them in politically enticing ways. Just as religion served industrial capitalism in the mid-1800s, our mental health sector now performs a similar function in late capitalism. The mental health interventions that have been preferred since the 1980s are the ones that have medicalized, pathologized, depoliticized, commodified, decollectivized, and individualized our emotional distress, robbing our suffering of its capacity to illuminate social ills, galvanize social action, and facilitate lasting and meaningful personal and social change. From this standpoint, I believe it is correct to view our mental health sector as the new opium of the people, a sector that sedates us both literally and ideologically, a sector whose structural roots need to be more fully apprehended if we are ever to give meaningful reform a meaningful chance. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for this riveting talk and clarifying how clearly the societies of the world are run for profit, not for people. Uh, so now we're open for questionnaires. Do we see any hands here? Please raise your hands if you want to ask Mr. Davis any questions. Yeah. Do you see any hope in the seminal paper in Nature last year discrediting the Prozac theory of serotonin? Uh, 
and its role in depression because the pharmaceutical companies and DSM-5 relies very, very heavily on the marketing of those antidepressant drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so that was uh, published by Joanna Moncrief, um, who's a, a British um, consultant psychiatrist at UCL. Uh, Mark Horowitz, who's, a, who's at um, UCL as well, a psychiatrist there. Uh, Michael Hengartner and, and others. And they essentially um, managed to do something which we've known for a long, long time, which was to uh, corroborate the notion that there isn't a chemical balance underpinning depression. Drugs don't co correct um, a chemical balance that's responsible for the problem. This was a, a myth that was largely foisted upon the population by the pharmaceutical industry, um, particularly in the 1990s, in order to warrant the prescription of the medications. If your depression is caused by an imbalance and the drugs correct the imbalance, then of course it's reasonable to take the medication. Um, and the, the, the tragic thing about this myth is that it's misled an entire generation, at least those within that generation who have subscribed to it, as to the nature of their suffering. They have been taught wrongly that their suffering is an outcome of some um, neurotransmitter imbalance, rather than their suffering be, being, um, as I said in the talk, a kind of protest against things within their lives that need to be more deeply thought about and addressed, rather than their suffering be a, a call to change. You know, and, and I think the individualization and the pathologization of suffering has really stripped our society of this more sociologically informed way of understanding uh, distress and what it may be seeking to communicate to us. So it's been very good for profit to quote, to quote you, but it's not been so good for people. And it's, and it's great news that finally most people now uh, are, are beginning to recognize that it's not a substantiated hypothesis. Thank you for your, your question. Hello, uh, thank Hello. you for an excellent uh, talk. Uh, I think we should also talk about some uh, consumptionism because uh, no one believes that they can be better without buying something, buying pills, uh, buying therapy, uh, instead of just talking to someone. Uh, so I think, uh, this uh, uh, yeah yeah it is so much connected to the consumerism we don't have to buy uh, things to be have a better uh, mental health we have to talk to others talk to some peers and uh, those who can understand and i think that is a big part of this problem yeah, so consumerism and materialism, um, you know, capitalism um, on steroids requires a populace to be locating the cause of many of their problems in consuming the right product. So you can consume your way to betterment or con consume your way to well-being. And, um, you know, shopping therapy is a, is, a, is a good expression we have in the UK. You know, by purchasing the right outcome, you can... You can, you can um, alter the very dynamics of self. And the idea that you can just consume uh, a medication and that's sufficient to transform um, the deeper regions of self towards something preferable um, appeals to that particular narrative. So there's not that much work that needs to be done beyond, um, beyond taking the pill. I, I don't blame people who um, take antidepressants for this at all. You know, people just want to feel better. I remember when I was a, a young lad in my, in my 20s, um, I went through a, a difficult, lots of people in the 20s do, I went through a difficult emotional period, right? I was very depressed, I was anxious, I was lost, I was quite underconfident. Um, you know, I was struggling socially, uh, having a diff difficult relationship with my girlfriend, you know, lots of lack of confidence. And it got to the point where I, I, I felt distressed enough to want to go and seek help. So I went to my, my local GP and I went in and I'd read a book at the time actually called Listening to Prozac by, by Peter Kramer. I'd read that book and become convinced that 
a pill would be a solution to all my problems. And I went to my GP and I asked for a medication. I said, listen, I've read this book. I've heard about this new wonder drug called Prozac. Would you be willing to prescribe it to me? And he looked at me and he said, <clears throat> well, young man, you don't look depressed to me. Why don't you go away, sit this one out, uh, and if things don't get better, come and see me in a few weeks. And I left the room and I was a bit grumpy about it, etc. Um, by the way, this was a GP in the 1990s. You don't counter such GPs in the UK today as much. Um, so I went away and I was grumpy and I struggled and I read more and I ended up in therapy and I took a very, very different route. But, you know, I, I completely sympathise with people wanting to fix uh, difficult emotions. Uh, I bought the narrative that this would work and so I went to seek help. And I think lots of people do buy that narrative. The trouble is the narrative... Um, in, in, in the view of many, is a false one and a misleading one, and ultimately can end up with the individual suffering more intently than they were at the outset. Uh, and that's another story to be told, the effects of the drugs themselves, the withdrawal effects, so forth, uh, and how by taking the medication you may believe that's sufficient, when actually it may not be. Okay, thank you. Th thank you for a very thought-provoking and inspiring talk okay. and I agree with almost everything you said uh, and I'm too cons also concerned about the, um, the growth of mental disorder in the DSM. I'm just wondering where to draw the line. Um, uh, another view is that we all have something. Uh, at some point um, most of us would be diagnosed with a disorder that is real, maybe in quot quotation marks, maybe not. Um, you know, and, and as an example, I think I would diagnose myself with at least three disorders in my, in my life. Uh, so I'm wondering, how do you see the DSM? Uh, do you see it as uh, that there are some of those disorders that are real? And some of them, uh, I should note, have many decades of research behind them. And as one example, major depressive disorder has been around since um, at least 1950. Most of the, the symptoms are the same since then. And Pfizer did not invent them. And the PHQ is actually corresponds to the same depression symptoms that were around in 1960 or so. However, I think that um, any clinician worth their salt would only use it as a screening instrument um, and not make a diagnosis without a diagnostic interview. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, some, some really uh, good points there. Um, Look, I think if we go to DSM, the, the part of DSM that I think was to some extent laudable and understandable was its attempt to bring order to chaos um, by creating a kind of classificatory system. Anthropology has taught us that whatever society you, you look at across the globe, every society has sought to bring order to chaos, create its own classificatory systems, classifying species of bird, nature, animal, etc., and so forth. This is something we do. We're, classif we're a classifying species. And so why not do it in the realm of emotional discontent? So I don't disagree with that project and the aspiration. And some of the phenomenological work, you know, is, is useful. But DSM doesn't stop there. What DSM then does is then presume to pronounce upon the meaning of that experience, right? So there are these different styles or patterns of suffering to which individuals more or less approximate. But these styles and patterns of suffering aren't styles and patterns of suffering. They're indexes of disorder and dysfunction within the self that need to be treated. That's an ideological move. That's a cultural move. That's the move for which there is no evidence. Okay? So it's not about denying the reality of the experience and how painful the experience is. It's about questioning the extent to which medicalizing and pathologizing the experience has been helpful. And that's where the debate resides. There's another element to this, of course, is the prescriptive nature of these diagnostic categories, the extent to which they can almost write a script to the individual as to how they need to pattern and perform their distress. I always remember working, uh, when I was starting out in the NHS, I was working um, in an outpatient psychotherapy unit, and I was working with a young man who... who um, um, had been diagnosed with bipolar and had been, out, been in and out of hospital for, for seven years or so. Uh, 
And one day he came in and he said to me, James, there's something you need to know. And I said, yes, what is it? And he said, well, a lot of the people on the ward, right, who get diagnosed with bipolar, they don't really have bipolar. They're faking it. And, and, I, and I, th I thought, well, OK, that's an interesting comment. And I tried to explore a little bit more with him as to why he believed people were faking it. And I remember going to my, my supervisor and discussing it in the, in, the, in the clinical team. And they said, oh, well, you know, obviously he's going through a difficult patch. We'll, we'll keep an eye on his meds and see if we might need to tweak things here and there. And I kind of broadly accepted that, that perspective at the time uh, until I began to encounter the research that shows the extent to which people actually, once they receive a diagnosis, learn about what the diagnosis implies and then begin to spontaneously adapt. It's called a looping effect. Hack hacking has spoken about it. Beginning to spontaneously and unconsciously adapt their behaviour to fit the script. So the performance of suffering begins to ever more closely align with the particular diagnostic script that you've been given. And what this young man was actually talking about was that. Rather than him imagining this, rather than him, um, as he believed, thinking they were consciously aping behaviour and deceiving, actually what was going on was something far more unconscious and something he'd picked up, again, uh, picked up upon. So the diagnostic system can do that as well. So when we therefore say we see these patterns across time and space, well, that could possibly be an artefact of this particular looping effect occurring. Because when we look at other societies across the globe, when you look at work like such as Arthur Kleiman's work, uh, who's a, a Harvard anthropologist and psychiatrist, you know, who has done a lot of ethnographic work on the different ways in which people express distress, we don't see such university ac across the globe. We begin to see university occur once DSMs and ICDs are exported to other countries and local languages of distress are reconfigured in a similar direction as we, as we, tend, to, as we tend to work. So it's a complicated area. Um, but anyway, hopefully that's addressed some of the points you raised. Thank you, for, thank you for raising those points. Eru fleiri spurningar? Já. Og þetta verður þá síðasta spurning fyrir kaffelji. Uh, I loved your reference with Marx in your uh, lecture. Yeah. And um, according to Marx, all systems are going to be revolutionized, you know, due to poor outcome and people are going to rise against them and, and change the system and another system is going to take over. Uh, do you think the, the mental health system is going to change? We're going to get something else, you know, maybe because of poor outcome. Do you think we will can and how will we and how can we get a system that will serve the needs of the people who are using it, not just political and economical, you know, section? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the question we all, we all ponder. Um, so it, it goes to the heart of it. How, how can things, how can things change? Um, you know, we have to raise consciousness around the extent to which the, the current model is failing, and I think that the, the data now is sufficient to enable us to reach that conclusion. Uh, I think that's a very important thing. I think we need to understand the mechanics of the sector, how it operates, why it's been so successful. So critical scrutiny, sociological scrutiny, is a key element here. But one of the conclusions I draw in the book, which is slightly more pessimistic, is that insofar as Marx and many other political and social thinkers have argued, insofar as they are correct in thinking that social institutions don't change unless there's wider systemic reform of political economy, that would imply the only way we're going to see change occur within the mental health sector, which is a specific social institution, is if we see wider structural reform within the political economy. So once political economy shifts in a direction that um, is more, if you like, humanistic, we will see a concomitant shift in services. There is some evidence that does, that's already happened within the mental health sector. If you think about um, the style of mental health ideology that dominated in the 60s and 70s, it was far more humanistic in tone than it is today. Um, 
the idea is that suffering was an index of some kind of social problem that needed to be addressed was very much more in the zeitgeist than it was post-1980s. And of course, pre-80s, it was the era of, of Keynesian capitalism, which again was a far more humanistic style of capitalism that operated. So we do see, if we look back in history, these interesting concordances between style of political economy and style of mental health ideology. And if that is true, and we were to extrapolate from that, I think the case would probably be, could be made that until we see wider political reform, we're not going to see the kind of change that many of us would like to see, at least to the extent we'd like to see it. Well, thank you very much for your talk. Let's give him a great round of applause.